Mark Aranas, a fourth year medical clerk, and I will be discussing pediatric history taking and PE. I would like to start with some disclaimers. Even though I'm now a medical clerk and done with my pedi rotation, I am still not all knowing with the history taking and PE. So please do not expect that I will give you a comprehensive discussion with this topic. Uh, for that would be futile. Like what I said, the only best way for you to learn is through practice. So please do not expect that after this lecture, all of you would be experts in doing so. But despite this, I will do my best to guide you in somehow properly conduct history taking and PE and give you an overview of how we do it in clerkship. So this will be a very advanced orientation for all of you. Second disclaimer, please be advised that I did not just stick to your recommended reference. I also used two other books, UST FMS Department of Pediatrics entitled Guide for History Taking and Physical Exam and Diagnosis of Pediatric Patients and Pedja Platinum. It is highly advisable that you read these books for you to fully pre prepare for clerkship, or they provide comprehensive discussion of the topic. So how to get a copy? Well, for the first book, uh, I got it from a higher year who lent it and allowed me to photocopy it. And I could do that for you if you want. And Pedja Platinum is available for online orders. You should be able to finish both before entering clerkship. For my last disclaimer, at the end of this lecture, I will be asking help from the fellow medical clerks in answering your queries with regards to the topic. Uh, I might miss some important points that my bat batch mates could help us be enlightened with. So batch 2020, please help me later. Thank you. Uh, now that I informed you all of this, uh, let's now officially start. For the topic outline, first, I'll be orienting you with the differences of PEDJA history, then give you basic concepts of making a good clinical history in PEDJA, then we'll be going through the contents of it and finally discuss the PE of a PEDJA patient. As for the learning objectives, at the end of this lecture, you should be able to recognize the variations in history taking and physical exam among PEDJA patients, and to be oriented for possible strategies that you can employ for PEDJA clinic patient encounters. Basically, uh, the pediatric history differ from that of the adult in two things, the content and the source. As for the source, most of the time, we get it indirectly from parents or any third party acting as a caregiver of the child. We have to take note that the parent, parents are important stakeholders in determining if we would get a good history. We must put in mind that the interpretation of the clinical features by the parents may be inaccurate. And also, we should take into consideration their percentage reliability, which I will discuss further later. Another important thing to observe is the parents or guardians behavior or emotions. Be wary of the red flags for child abuse or neglect. Next is the men. Uh, as you can see here, this is the usual history taking components we do in medicine for adult patients. And this now is what a PEDJA history looks like. It is definitely longer. Those highlighted in gray are distinctive to PEDJA history. The prenatal, natal, and neonatal history are not always present. You will include these to patients less than two years old, yes, less than two years old, and those patients who have related illness currently from these histories. The other three must always be included, the feeding, growth and development, and immunization history. You now know the differences of PEDJA history. Next, let's, let's discuss the basic concepts of good pediatric clinical history. 
Okay, let's say that today is your PEDA patient encounter and you were assigned to an admitted patient. First thing that you have to keep in mind is to start the interview with the parents or guardians on a positive note. What we did back then was to assign only one interviewer for that meeting and all others were responsible for taking down notes. You have to understand that the parent or guardian that you are about to interview might already feel irritated from the repetitive questioning that they have been through, starting from the ER clerk, admitting clerk, resident, and the consultants in charge for your patient. And extend your patience if they appear reluctant in participating in the interview. Supply, so please try to build a rapport to the caregiver first. Having one interviewer all throughout the history taking is better then distributing the parts of the history to all of you and interview one by one. When we have only one interviewer, the one in charge will be able to know if the information of the parent uh, is giving already answers other parts of the history so that they will not be questioned again. For there are times when they, when they are overly active, providing answers that the parts of the history overlap. Okay, for the interviewer in charge, you start the interview by introducing yourself and your group. Explain that you'll be doing history taking and PE of the patient. And tell the caregiver that this will be a part of your training as medical students. And their cooperation and participation in your activity would be highly appreciated. With this said, you are recognizing the parents as important stakeholders in what you will do and that you are not treating them as routine fulfillment for a requirement. Being flexible in obtaining clinical data is also important. Should be able to extract accurate information from the caregiver. For example, the parent claims that they were able to complete the immunization of their child. Then you should ask if they have a record of it and get a copy. Or when they have given a medication, that they can no longer remember, you could ask if they brought it with them or ask the way they were administering the drug. Then you could give names of drugs that might ring a bell to them and allow them to remember. The last three is about how you must direct the interview with a caregiver. You have to ask pertinent symptoms, keeping up with the likely differentials, and also know how the caregiver arrived at a certain diagnosis of a disease. And no matter how insistent the parent is about the patient's condition, always keep in mind an open mind and have your own ground. For example, the parent brought her child 12 midnight due to persistent vomiting. The mother insists that her child had food poisoning. However, from taking that line of thinking, you interviewed and found out that no other family members had the same symptoms, who also ate the same food as the child. You asked for other symptoms and the parent noted that the child had fever for three days already, anorexic and with abdominal pain and had diarrhea. From there, that vomiting could really not be attributed anymore from food poisoning, which the parent is insisting. Knowing that the clinical course is like that, you suspect that the child is having dengue fever with warning signs, and persistent vomiting is actually one of it. So again, here are the basic concepts of a good PEDA clinical history. Start on a positive note, be flexible, pursue the symptoms, keep on track, and keep an open mind, and have your own ground. Let's now talk about the contents of a pediatric history. For this purpose, we will be using a template. And I thought that the best standard template that we should use is the one we use in the hospital, projected on your screen. This is a two pages back-to-back -back admitting history we medical clerks bring with us when we hear the teaching, one PEDA clerk on deck, please proceed to ER now. So aside from history, this also provides a template for PE. 
I highly advise that you use this as a basis for your template if your batch is going to make one for Peja Decorate. Okay, let's now discuss these contents one by one using the SLU HSH Department of Pediatrics Admitting History. Let's go to the general data. As you can see, what you just have to do is to fill in the blanks from the name, age, etc. What I would like to highlight here is the percentage reliability. Our preceptor back then, Dr. Domingo, asked us how do we grade it, knowing that it is subjective, how do we really make an objective grading? He told us that there are four important factors to consider. First, the relationship, then the number of hours, informant stays to the patient, the educational attainment of the informant, and involvement in the care of patient. I think the most important among the four factors is the number of hours the informant stays with the patient. Because that way, you are assured that they will be able to provide accurate data for the HPI. The other data would come second to HPI because we want to make sure we arrive at the correct diagnosis. So what are lacking in our standard template? There are two, the age classification, and race or ethnicity. After giving the age, you must provide a classification for your patient. So for those within the first few hours of life, uh, they are classified as newborn. Neonates are those in the first 28 days of life, infant 29 to one year, toddler two to three, preschool four to six, school age seven to 12, and adolescents, 13 to 18 years old. Next is the chief complaint. This answers the question, why was the patient brought to the hospital? In Pejadecury, you will be under different preceptors and you will notice that they have their own techniques in doing things. One of which is in formulating the chief complaint. One preceptor will tell you that you just have to translate into medical jargon the exact words of the informant. Another will tell you that a chief complaint is not just a single symptom, but rather you should add other related symptoms for you to come up with an impression and have various differentials in mind to guide you later in questioning the HPI. Well, it would be up to you to filter these uh, teachings of your preceptors. You could adapt or reject according to your judgment, if that would help you become a better physician. Anyway, uh, the chief complaint should never be verbatim nor use local dialect, for this is part of a medical report and it is considered a legal document. Also, you should not use diagnostic terms or names of diseases for the chief complaint. For asymptomatic patients, you could write for follow-up, for CP clearance, for well baby care and for immunization for the chief complaint. Let's now move on to the HPI. A sample projected here is how we write chief complaint and HPI in the admitting history. Uh, for instance, a pediatric patient came to the ER with a chief complaint Doc, sumasakit po ang ulo ko paminsan-minsan at mainit ang pakiramdam ko po. You could translate this as occasional headache and fever or intermittent headache and fever. As for the HPI, for the written admitting history, you could put it in bullet form as shown in the picture and then convert to paragraph form for the type written history that is due within 24 hours. So this is the type written form of the HPI. Symptoms are arranged in chronological order. As for our patient, uh, we have one day and four hours prior to admission. So just do the same OPQRST we all know. In our case, one day prior to admission, patient had headache and fever. Headache is further characterized as to quality, intensity, frequency, and location. 
And the associated symptoms and pertinent negatives were also asked underlined in the picture. Four hours prior to consult, patient had fever, vomiting, and abdominal pain. These are also characterized as to quality and quantity. And again, the associated symptoms and pertinent negatives were asked and underlined here. Medication was also written here with the generic name. And as for the brand name, place it in a parenthesis and together with the dose and duration given. Uh, this patient actually underwent laboratory workup, including CBC, urinalysis, and dengue NS1. Urinalysis revealed unremarkable results. However, uh, CBC showed increased hematocrit and low platelet, and dengue NS1 turned out to be positive. Resident in charge decided to admit the patient as dengue fever with warning signs, which is justified by the HPR. Hi. The whining signs identified were the clinical symptom of abdominal pain and the laboratory findings of elevated hematocrit and low platelet count. So here are the other important notes in writing HPI. If the patient is newborn and or present problems are related to the prenatal and perinatal period, the maternal and birth history should be included in the HPI. And with history suggesting a particular disease, relentlessly pursue the symptoms characteristic of the disease. Like in our sample a while ago, uh, dengue was highly suspected, as a pro so the probable signs and warning signs of dengue were extracted. Pertinent negatives are of value as this will help in ruling in or out your different differentials. If previous admissions are related to the present illness, it should be written in the first paragraph. Like for example, uh, in a case of admission due to a complication from a primary disease like CKD, patient was admitted again due to hypertensive crisis. Write in the first paragraph the year when the patient developed CKD and then summarize the progression of the disease as interval history. Okay, knowing all these, you should be able to make a good HPI, which should allow you to formulate an initial impression and differential diagnosis. Okay, next, the personal history. Like what I said before, this birth history should only be included for those less than two years old. But if these are related to the illness of children greater than two years old, then it must be included. Gestational or prenatal history is all about the time the patient was still inside the mother's womb. Birth or natal history is during the time of delivery, while neonatal history is the first few hours to days of life of the newborn. Asking for the maternity book could help you feel the prenatal history and the, and the baby book would really help you get important details like for the natal and neonatal history from birth measurements, APGAR score, and Ballard score, and also newborn screening results. APGAR scoring actually is just nice to know. Next part of the personal history is the feeding history. What is shown here is a sample of early feeding history during infancy from the type of feeding and complementary food introduction to the infant. This could be omitted if your patient is greater than or equal to two years old. Instead, you should assess the appetite of these patients if good or picky. So this is an early feeding history that could be omitted for greater than two years old. What is consistent for all age groups is the sample diet for a day. Later, I will show you a sample for it. Next is the growth and development history. For physical growth, 
anthropometric measurements must be taken. However, we will discuss this further later in the PE section. So this is how a sample diet should be recorded. Ask for the food intake from breakfast, AM snack, lunch, PM snack, and dinner. Then search the internet for their equi equivalent kcal. Like for example, one bowl of oatmeal is equivalent to 160 kcal. And then get the total caloric intake for that day. As you can see here, it's 974 kcal. Then you will compare this to the Remy that is age and sex specific. As for this sample of a, a sample diet of a 13 year old male, his current diet is insufficient. As per the daily requirement, recommended energy intake of 2,700 kcal. This table is from the Philippine Dietary Reference Intake of Food and Nutrition, Re Nutrition Research Institute, revised last September 2018. Going back to the growth and development history, what is shown here as a table of modified developmental checklist with gross motor, fine motor, language, and personal or social parameters. This is used for young children age, ages 1 to 5 years old. So you'll use this for 1 to 5 years old. All you have to do is to tick the box if the child was able to do, the, to do these activities in accordance with their age of development. At the end, you would evaluate if the developmental milestones of the child are delayed or at par with age. Speech and social development would be based on school performance and interaction with family and peers. Here are the additional data to be extracted from the following age groups. So like what I said a while ago, for ages one to five years old, you tick the box for the modified developmental checklist. You add other behavioral problems in your uh, data gathering like urinary incontinence, toilet training, temper tantrums, head banging, any phobias, spica, night terrors, or sleep disturbances. And a uh, special extraction of data for 13 to 20 years old would be the heads. You have to ask for home, education, eating behavior and habits, activities, uh, and like involvement in sports, drugs, and even smoking sexual activities, and suicidal ideations. With regards with the sexual activities, you should be extra sensitive and ask for the parent or guardian to leave the room first if you would ask this so that the teenager would answer without hesitation. And as for suicidal ideations, observe the mood of the teenager during the interview and their relation with their parents. If you can send some red flags, please do not hold back in inquiring about their psychiatric condition. And what is consistent for all age groups is this, the sexual development assessment using Tanner maturity rating. You have to do this especially when you notice a precocious or delayed puberty among PEDIA patients. Next is immunization history. All age groups must be provided with this. So this is how you should tabulate the vaccines administered to the patient from dates of doses or boosters given or where they got it, either from a local health center or a private clinic. And if there is an adverse reaction, so if, for example, an 18-year-old patient could no longer remember his or her immunization history and has lost the record but claims to have completed it, you should still make a table of vaccines that, uh, was pro that, should, that she should receive at her age. 
because if you omit uh, this part and reason to your preceptor that you could not extract any information, they will still deduct points from you for incomplete data. So this is the Childhood Immunization Schedule revised last 2019. Use this to check the vaccine status of your patient. So let's say you have a one-year-old patient. Those vac vaccines inside the red box should have been given already to them from BCG, Hep B, and the rest. This is very useful to keep in your phones for a quick check during interviews. One good practice that I would share to you uh, is to always advocate administration of vaccines. Educate parents who are skeptical of its benefits and give accolade to those parents who completed vaccines of their children. Now we are down to the last part of pediatric personal history, which is past medical history. For the past hospitalizations, ask where, when, why, and how long, and inquire about the severity and the complications. For childhood illnesses, ask for contagious diseases like measles, varicella, chicken pox, and mumps. Also ask about asthma, uh, food and drug allergies as well, and the current medications the child is taking. Oh, so what is missing here is the if the child had past surgical procedures done. Okay, so let's recap. The past personal history in PEJA includes uh, one, birth history, and then feeding history, growth and development history, immunization, and past medical history. So there are five components of past personal history in PEJA. We now go to the family history. In our template, it's just very short. We just ask the state of physical health of the parents and the siblings, and family history of bronchial asthma, hypertension, diabetes, and other comorbids. And as for the socioeconomic and environmental history, we inquire about the parents' occupation and educational attainment their living, economic, and environmental circumstances. Some of the data we get here might play an important factor in the development of the disease in our patient. For example, here we can identify possible asthma triggers of a child. And one possible trigger is the presence of pets inside the house. Or if there is a smoker in the family, we can educate them about secondhand smoking and its grave effects. And we must also be advocates of primary health care. For prevention of common diseases, educate them about healthy lifestyle and diet that they could adapt, like proper hand washing, how to do cough etiquette. These simple things really do have a big impact among them. We should not just be asking and asking questions to fill up our templates, we must also be concerned about the possible ways we can help in improving their health by sharing knowledge to them. So that's another good practice for you to do. The last part of PEJA history is the ROS. So this is just a checklist of symptoms. Use this to validate information gathered in the HPI and ask only those appropriate to the age of the patient. One thing that I would like to emphasize is with regards to pubertal and adolescent female, so please take note of the LMP, history of menstrual periods from onset, regularity, frequency, and pain. Uh, this is usually forgotten. Now we go to the last topic for my discussion, PE of PEDJA patients. You also have basic concepts of doing PE and PEJA, as shown here. First is prepare your PEJA paraphernalia. 
In your PEDRA decury, should be always in complete uniform and always have complete instruments from your tongue depressor, spend light, reflex hammer, and the others. That you should not miss anything, especially when your preceptor is Dr. Ramolete. You would not want to be reprimanded by her, I'm telling you. I advise that at least one of you in your group should buy a thermogun, acute tape measure, Peja Pulse Ox, a pediatric BP cuff, and of course, toys. The thermogun is really important. Uh, however, this is not recommended by Peja residents. But it would really be a big help for you if you have a stubborn and uncooperative patients. The tape measure is very important in getting the anthropometric measurements. The Peja Pulse Ox would save you a lot of time because it is hard to get the autosaturation of a child with a regular adult Pulse Ox. As for the BP cuff of Peja, this varies among age groups. If you can't buy it, you could just borrow from your ate or kuya clerks. As for the toys, you should be willing to give whatever that you will bring for the patient. And this would be really be helpful in getting the attention of your patient. Next is establishing connect rapport. Uh, we should establish connection with our patient because it is an important concept that we must learn because by doing so, we will gain the trust and confidence of the child and he or she would be more likely to cooperate during the examination. Every age group requires special techniques. Like for example, in toddlers, they respond well to making a game out of the procedure, while school-aged children respond well when you explain the purpose of your instrument. And always approach a child at his or her level of understanding. Here is an example. Ate Anna Jem explained to the child how to use a stethoscope. By doing so, she captured the child's attention and built a connection. This simple act can actually inspire a child in seeing doctors who are very enthusiastic and caring. And as for the last three concepts, these are self-explanatory. Just keep in mind that you have to always explain and ask consent from a child. Anything that you will do to them, keep the child distracted and have a long patience for stubborn and uncooperative ones. From basic concepts, we also have to discuss the differences in doing PE of a PEDIA patient. So there are three, from approach, maneuvers, and normal values. First is the approach. The usual order in examination of adults is not often appropriate for young children. Should be able to adapt to various situations and circumstances surrounding the examination. So a best practice is to leave more unpleasant or uncomfortable parts of the PE last. Take advantage when the patient is asleep. This is the time that you could auscultate for the heart and lungs. And when the patient is crying, that is the best time for you to inspect the throat. As for infants and below, it is best to examine them with minimum clothing on. Playful interactions and distractions help ally anxiety of child and facilitate examination. As a last resort for stubborn and uncooperative patients, you could immobilize them to do certain procedures safely. Next, the maneuvers. The maneuvers you do for an age group would not be the same for the other. Like when neonate differs from that of a toddler when you are doing a neurologic exam. I provided a link here in this PowerPoint for you to watch how to conduct a head-to-toe -to -toe assessment to an infant. I really think that the only way for you to learn PE is through demonstration. And for you to really learn, practice doing this in your PEJA decury. 
Lastly, the normal values also differ among each groups. Again, going back to our template, shown here is how you should put PE data in your report. For the general survey, you could write it this way. Patient is weak, looking, awake, coherent, irritable, no signs and symptoms of dehydration, ambulatory, well-developed, poorly nourished, and not in cardiopulmonary distress. It includes the mental state, the affectivity state of hydration from no, moderate, or severe, ambulatory or bedridden, nutritional state, ill-looking, and CP distress. And as for the vital signs, here's what you need to know. We do blood pressure taking for uh, uh, ages greater than three years old, okay? Remember that. And you, you do that the same way as with the adult. However, you have to use the appropriate size of BP cuff to your patient. And as for the cardiac rate and RR, you have to do always a full minute count, okay? Always do a full minute count for cardiac rate and RR. As for the respiratory rate, uh, the usual way we count it is by looking at the men, especially for uh, young children and babies, because the ribs of these children are horizontal and they rely, rely more on the descent of their diaphragm in increasing their thoracic cavity. So they have an abdominal type of respiration. So that's how you do counting of RR in babies and young children, okay? And then as for the temperature, uh, even though the bang bang or thermogun is not really recommended, uh, you could do it for stubborn and uncooperative patients. However, uh, what we highly recommend is the axillary temperature. The normal values for uh, the different age groups varies. So you do not really have to memorize any of it. In clerkship, we were given pedigrees that we put in a small notebook. And we use it as a reference for these pediatric values. Just have it in your phone for quick reference during PE. What I want all of you to memorize is this. The WHO cutoff values for tachypnea. One of the most common cases in PEDIA would be pneumonia, and the most reliable criterion for diagnosis of pneumonia among children is tachypnea. These values were asked by our preceptors back then, and also in San Lazaro Hospital, they emphasized these values during the teaching rounds in pneumonia PEDIA ward. So this is very easy to memorize. Just know the age groups from newborn, 2 to 12 months, 1 to 5 years, and greater than 5. Then the equivalent values are just 60, 50, 40, and 30. And greater than these values are considered tachypnea. Another thing that I would like to emphasize is to know how to, de 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 to detect pediatric hypertension presented in this table. You can see here the pediatric uh, BP categories and stages for children ages 1 to 13 years old and for greater than 13 years old. So let's see. An 8-year-old male came in the ER due to sudden onset of periorbital and pre-tibial edema. His parents also noted that he seldom urinates and if he does, he passes out minimal amount of dark colored urine. Three weeks ago, he was diagnosed with tonsillopharyngitis that has since resolved without treatment. From the clinical presentation and history of tonsillopharyngitis, you already have something in mind, right? This is more likely a case of PSGN. 
Urinalysis was done revealing 1 plus protein, numerous RBCs, and RBC cas. Also, he has an elevated creatinine and BUN. Pertinent PE revealed BP of 115 over 74. Other findings were essentially normal except for edema. With that information, the patient fulfills the criteria for nephritic syndrome, which are oliguria from the observation of decreased frequency of urination, hematuria from urinalysis findings of numerous RBCs, and azotemia from elevated crea and BUN. As for hypertension, we will check later if the child uh, falls under any categories presented a while back. So those highlighted in red, uh, this OHHA is a mnemonic for the common clinical signs and symptoms of a nephr nephritic syndrome. So remember that OHA, associate OHA to nephritic syndrome. And the most common cause of nephritic syndrome among PEDGA patients is PSGN. So we are really confident to say that this is a clinical case of PSGN. Let's check if our patient is really hypertensive. For us to do that, we have to use the BP percentile table projected on your screen. The first step uh, is you look for the age and sex appropriate table for our patient. So here we have boy and age of eight, year, eight years old. Second step, the measured height of our patient, which is 141 centimeters. You will locate this value in the row of height percentile pointed by the black arrow. So you read horizontally. And there is our height inside the black square. Third step is for you to look now at the BB percentile column. That is below the located height measurement. Then you read vertically going down. So let's read first for the systolic blood pressure of our patient, which is uh, 115. So among these values, 112 comes before it. And it would be equivalent to 98 BP percentile. Next, let's look at the diastolic blood pressure of our patient, which is 74. And among these values, 75 comes after it, which is equivalent to 95th percentile. So the BP of our patient, which is 115 over 74, falls between the ranges of 112 to 75 mmHg, which translates to a BP percentile between 90th and 95th percentile. Going back to the table, the BP category that we will use is that of 13 years old. Okay? And here it is, the 90th to 95th percentile. So our patient has an elevated BP, but we still cannot say that our patient is hypertensive. He will be diagnosed hypertensive only if he is able to meet any of the criteria in this table on three or more clinic visits. So for you to consider hypertension in pediatrics, it has to be on three or more clinic visits. I have attached in this PowerPoint the BB percentile tables that you will use, so please just print a copy of it. So how about hypotension? Here's a table of cutoff values for us to detect hypotension. Let's say a five-year-old child has a BP of 70 over 40. We will have to compute for the child is within one to 10 years old. As you can see here, there's a formula. So systolic blood pressure is equal to 70 plus age in years, which is 5 times 2. This is equal to 80 mmHg. A BP of 70 over 40 considered hypotensive 
for this five years old patient, since the six systolic blood pressure is less than 80 mmHg. We are now done with the general survey and vital signs. Let's now go to the anthropometric measurements. For children less than two years old, an infant weighing scale must be used and weight is preferably taken with minimal clothing on. For children who can stand, use regular calibrated hospital weighing scales, removing their shoes and allowing the child to stand by his or herself with the hands at the side. Next for the length and height. To find length of children less than two years old should be measured by two observers. Okay, using, using a measuring board, the crown of the head should touch the stationary vertical headboard, shoulders, buttocks flat on the surface, rest arms against the sides, and extend legs gently and record the length. As for height, height is measured for those two years old and above. Uh, it is measured in standing position with heels touching together, uh, the buttocks touching and the shoulders touching the board, and the head midline. For the head, chest, and abdominal circumferences, we use non-distensible plastic tape measure. The head circumference it is measured over the supraorbital ridge and extended circumferenti circumferentially to include most prominent part of the occiput. For the chest circumference, should be measured in mid-inspiration with the tape running horizontally around the chest using the siphoid, siphoid notch as a reference point. For abdominal circumference, in infants, it is measured on the umbilicus. For older children, the subject stands and measurement is taken midway between inferior margin of the last rib and the crest of ilium. Arm span is measured from the patient to stand, uh, as the patient to stand straight with arms outstretched sidewise parallel to the ground and the palms facing front, measured from the tip of the right to the tip of the left middle finger. The lower segment for zero to three years old is measured with the child supine from the umbilicus to the tip of the toes flex at 90 degrees of the heel. While for those greater than three years old, is measured standing from assis to the floor. The upper segment is just measured by subtracting the lower segment from the length or height uh, you measured a while ago. So the upper and lower segment ratio should, be should help you detect skeletal deformities or growth disorders among pediatrics. Normal values are presented here. If there is an increase in ratio, that means the patient has short lower limb seen in achondroplasia or skeletal dysplasia. If there is decrease in ratio, that could indicate there is short trunk as seen in scoliosis or short neck for Turner syndrome. Once we already have these anthropometric measurements, we can now plot this on the WHO growth chart to determine nutritional assessment. BMI for age is used to assess obesity, overweight, possible risk of overweight, wasted or severely wasted. Weight for age now is used to assess whether child is underweight or severely underweight. Length or height for age is used to identify who are standard or tall for age. So this is how we interpret the plotted data. Uh, let's now try to plot and use table. We have a six weeks old girl with the following measurements. First step in plotting is to find the age and sex appropriate growth chart for the patient. 
And for this parameter, length for age, this is the appropriate growth chart for the patient. Second step is to look at the x-axis representing the age and then the y-axis representing the length. Then we plot accordingly. So six weeks is here, place it, and then 51 centimeters for length. So they meet here. And then third step is to look at the value of z-score at the other side of the graph. Our plot is at the line. So take note, it's at the line of negative 2. But that does not mean the z-score is negative 2. It is still considered as a z-score of 0. Remember this. As a general rule, remember that you have to go beyond the line for the value to be valid. Let's now use this table to interpret the z-score of at negative 2 or 0, that means 0, or median. So for the length or height for age, that is still normal. Okay? Z-score of at negative 2 or median or 0 is normal. Okay. For the next parameter, weight for age, it is plotted here, which is beyond, beyond the line of negative 2. So that value now is truly valid negative 2. Using the table to interpret for weight for age, okay, weight for age, which is below negative 2, that is interpreted as underweight. So a z-score below negative Below negative 2 is underweight. Okay. For the last parameter, BMI for age is plotted here, which is beyond the line of negative 1. So that is a valid negative 1. Okay. Using again the table for BMI for age, below negative 1 here is also normal. Okay. I also attach a link in this PowerPoint for the compiled PEJA group charts that you could use. So secure, just secure your own copy and print. We now move on to the examination of the scheme. So you have to note for pallor, jaundice, warm or cold to touch, presence or absence of skin turgor, if there are rashes, the decay or pigmentation. Next for the HENT, I will no longer enumerate this to you. Instead, I will just emphasize on some points that I deem important. Here, always do a skin pinch test to your PEJA patients to assess for dehydration. As you can see in the picture, there is skin tenting, an indication of moderate to severe dehydration, which is a red flag. Another red flag is the sunken or bulging fontanelles. A sunken fontanelle indicate dehydration, while a bulging fontanelle indicate increase in intracranial pressure. And be wary of possible seizures in your patient when you see a bulging fontanelle. Notify the resident immediately when you notice these red flags. For the examination of the ear in infants, uh, even though this is not an infant, uh, but this is how you do it in infants. Uh, the ear should be pulled downwards and posteriorly. And for older children, the pina should be pulled up and back. So please correct your trances uh, because this is the correct way of doing it, uh, relating it to the orientation of ear canal according to the age of the patient. So what do you expect to see when you use your otoscope? Most common finding would be an impacted cerumen, as you can see in this picture. And then this is how a perforated tympanic membrane would look like. In the last picture to your left is how otitis media would look like. There will be bulging of tympanic mem membrane and hyperemia. So that is otitis media. Another red flag that I frequently miss is that of alar flaring. This is an indication of respiratory distress. 
and is usually accompanied by grunting. So inform your residents if you see any of these red flags. We move on with the rest of the PE. Again, I will no longer enumerate these to you, but instead highlight some important points in the next slides. As for the mouth, look for this lesion at the buccal mucosa. These are coplic spots. And you see this in measles patients. It's usually present two to three days after the three Cs. And what are the three Cs? Cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis. And it fades from the onset, one day from the onset of fever. And when your case is acute tonsillopharyngitis, please do grading of the tonsils. This will be asked by your preceptor. As for the chest and lungs, here are the common areas you must look at for retractions. The supracavicular, suprasternal, intercostal, substernal, and subcostal retractions. For the abdomen, the recommended method of gathering and reporting your data follows the IAPEPA sequence. Uh, this is also done in our template, but I just want to emphasize, always do IAPEPA for gathering and recording. And then take note of this table for the expected liver spans for infants, children, and adolescents. For the genitalia, shown here is epispagia and hypospagia. Uh, there are abnormal urethral openings located at the dorsal and ventral areas, respectively. And this is a visual uh, representation of tanner maturity rating. Uh, I just want you to be familiar with this too. And for the patient coming in with a chief complaint of abdominal pain, a little rectal exam is usually done, and it is best carried out with the child in left lateral decubitus, with the right leg drawn up into his or her abdomen, and the head curled down as if in fetal position. Use a glove index finger in older children and your little finger in young infants. And please don't forget to use lubricant. This is used to assess sphincter tone, presence of mass or impacted feces, and tenderness. And don't forget to explain to the parents the need to do so and always ask for consent. Next, for the extremities, I would like to emphasize on examination of clubbing. This can easily be done by opposing the dorsal surfaces of the terminal phalanges of the index fingers. And normally, there is a diamond shape space at the base of the knee bed. However, in clubbing, the space is lost as seen in the picture. This is important because clubbing is usually associated with heart, lung, liver, and gastrointestinal diseases. And the pathophysiology to explain it is the increased distal digital dilation that would now lead to increased, increased blood flow. And this is usually caused by hypoxia and increase in vasodilators. So clubbing is really an important red flag for you to note because it is usually associated with various pathologic mechanisms indicating an underlying organ system disease. Lastly, do not forget to inspect for the spine. If you note any asymmetry to the patient's back, shown here is the bend forward test done by asking the patient to bend forward with both hands hanging down as if to touch the feet. Patient is positive for oscoliosis if a hump is seen, shown here. We are down to the last topic, which is neuro exam in PEJA. I admit that this is one of the most challenging because in contrast to the assessment of adults and older children, examination of newborn and infants involve largely of observation only. 
Other issues include eliciting accurate answers from PEDIA patients, which is really hard to determine. And cooperation too is sometimes an issue among young children. Then for infant neonates, uh, it would require much delicate maneuvers to be able to do an examination safely. And I don't think that enumerating this new template would really help you. The only way for you to really learn how to do a good new exam is through watching a demo. So I'm just giving you an assignment to watch the video that I will share to you. For this way, you will be able to see how to actually conduct a neuro exam. I would just like to emphasize on these red flags. Do test for meningeal irritation if you suspect your patient having meningitis. Here is Koenig sign. Positive when there is resistance to extension of the leg while the hip is flexed. With the Brudzinski sign, uh, this is positive. There is flexion of the hips and knees in response to neck flexion. And I would like to note, uh, to know, for you to know the true Brudzinski sign. The patient should still be able to rotate her neck from his or her neck from left or right extend the neck and the only problem that should be present for a true positive Brudzinski neck sign is the resistance while doing flexion, neck flexion. And also do take note of the times these primitive reflexes disappear to know if there is an abnormality in the development of the child. Well, that's it. Uh, thank you for listening, and I hope you learned something from my discussion. I'm ending this lecture with a quote from a book I love entitled, Some Days You Can't Save Them All, written by Dr. Ronnie E. Baticolon. So here it goes. Remember your patients. Whatever greatness you will achieve, you owe to them, especially the ones who are no longer with us. I dedicate this lecture to baby Aviles, a uh, 26 days old male neonate who passed away due to septic shock, interventricular hemorrhage, cerebral edema, electrolyte imbalance, hyperglycemia, secondary to multi-organ dysfunction. He was my first mortality as a clinical clerk. We've been together for a week and on his eighth day, I lost him. Why did this child die? Well, we all know the answer to that, as I stated his final diagnosis. A more important question now is, why did this child have to die? How could his life end so soon? He was not given a chance to play, learn, or even say I love you to his parents who grieved so much from his incomprehensible loss. I came to a point where I thought, maybe it was me. It was I who was to blame. Maybe I did not do my part well. Maybe I failed baby Aviles. If only I could have monitored him consistently despite my physical exhaustion and lack of sleep. Or if only I could have referred earlier the red flags. He could still be alive this day. I learned a very important lesson from baby Aviles. We, doctors, should not blame ourselves when we lose a patient. What matters is that we are with them in their journey of healing. And we did our best to support them in the struggles along the way. And we lift them up to our God and believe that the higher power is at work. And we are only instruments of his healing grace. So remember your patients and remember God is with you in this higher calling of being a doctor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening. And here's the link for the video that uh, I'm providing you as an assignment, Bates Visual Guide to Pediatric Head-to-Toe Assessment. And 
Here's the link for pediatric growth charts. And for the succeeding slides, I provided the BB percentile tables that you should print. Okay, uh, we are now open for your questions or queries. We